Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Reading with Raptors. I'll wait till a few more people get in before we start reading. Right now, we're just enjoying hanging out outside in <laughs> hanging out outside in one of our uh, display enclosures here in the main visitor center at the Raptor Center. Uh, we're enjoying this really wonderful spring weather that we're having for the very end of March. Um, so hopefully all of you have been able to get outside, stretch your legs, um, go out and see all of the wildlife that's coming back right now. Today we're going to be reading a book that talks a lot about migration, which I thought was a very fitting subject um, for the bird I have behind me. This is one of our resident peregrine falcons. We call her Artemis. And um, she's one of our most senior of our education birds. She's actually recently retired from going out into the public. So she's an excellent example of a peregrine falcon who um, normally is just seen here at the Raptor Center in these uh, brand new display enclosures that we finished renovating uh, last fall and kind of are finishing working up on now. Um, all of those made, of course, possible by the support of our community. So thank you all so much. Um, she is perched on top of right now. We have this wonderful fake cliff that she's on and actually it's made to look like a ramp kind of on this side and then I'm actually sitting on the bottom side of it right now. So not the usual perching use of this enclosure, but we figured we'd give it a shot for today. So she's gonna be working on right now. She's ripping up a nice chunk of quail, which is kind of like a very small, sorry, it's mirrored, a very small bird. Think of like a very small fancy chicken is what she's working on right now. So I have some more food for her later if she needs it, but right now she's working on taking all the feathers off of there. Hopefully that lighting works well. So if you have questions as we read, definitely feel free to put them in the comments. Um, if you were with us last week, our feed uh, cut off at about 40 minutes. So I'm hoping to avoid that this time. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna try to aim for under that. Uh, but if you have questions that we don't have time for, keep putting them in the comments on the video and we will answer them in text form as well. So our reading for today. We are going to be reading The Peregrine's Journey Sorry, I'm playing with the mirroring. There we go. The Peregrine's Journey, a story of migration. Very fitting topic for this time of year as we get into the springtime. This is by Madeline Dunphy and illustrated by Kristen Kest. So this wonderful picture of a peregrine falcon flying there. Before we start, someone was asking me how much do they eat? Um, she's getting about 80 grams of quail, so that's a little bit less than a quarter of a pound, if that makes sense. Normally a peregrine falcon might catch something like a woodpecker or something like that, or here in the cities they're going to be eating things like pigeons. Um, they'll also catch things like woodpeckers, a lot of the migrating songbirds that are coming through right now. So they can eat a lot of food at once and then not need to worry so much about hunting for a little bit. So she's going to be working on that quail. I don't know if you can hear the fun crunching noises. So, The Peregrine's Journey, A Story of Migration. Here is a map to start us off. I'll try to get it close enough so you can see. And it points out a few places. So here we have Canada, the United States, Mexico, and South America. And so we're gonna be following this path of all these little orange dots all the way down to South America. So that's what we're gonna be looking at in a peregrine's journey. This is a wonderful picture of Alaska. The peregrine falcon wakes up on a cliff in Alaska. She perches near the nest where she raised her chicks this summer. Even though it is only September, it has already snowed and the puddles are covered with ice. She ruffles her feathers to try to keep warm, but she is restless. As each day passes, the weather will only get colder and there will be less and less sunlight. Finally, the time has come for her to leave. She takes one last look at her Alaska home and then begins her migration south. She will fly all the way from Alaska to Argentina, a distance of more than 8,000 miles. It will take her about two months. If you tried walking that far, it would take you more than three years. Here's this beautiful picture of a peregrine falcon on a cliff in Alaska.
The peregrine flies over the Yukon. You might wonder how she knows where she is going. She doesn't have a map or compass, but she has something even better, instinct. The per excuse me, the peregrine was n born knowing where to fly. She also has very good eyesight. From high in the sky, she can see far away in all directions. She sees the coastline, a wide flowing river, and some mountains with high peaks. To her, the mountains and rivers are like maps and street signs. These landmarks help her know where she is. See the peregrine flying over the mountains and the river, heading towards the coast. The peregrine arrives in British Columbia. The trees are so thick and grow so closely together that she cannot see the ground. Her wings beat up and down in a steady rhythm. She has already flown a hundred miles today. Through an opening in the trees, she sees a freeway. The peregrine is such a strong flyer that she travels almost as fast as the people in their cars below. I like this picture a lot. You can see the peregrine falcon and the fall colors coming in. And do you see here, way down at the bottom, you can see the freeway. A familiar sight to some of us. The peregrine lands in Seattle, Washington. She perches on the windowsill of an office building and looks down. Far below, amidst the honking cars, traffic lights, and rushing people, she notices something that interests her. It is a pigeon. She watches it fly from the sidewalk to a tree and then to a building across the street. Pigeons are one of her favorite foods, so there is plenty for her to eat in the city. You can see the peregrine falcon sitting on top of those buildings. And do you see? the pigeons in the background. Very nice. The peregrine must hunt every day to feed herself. From a mountain ledge in Utah, she sees a dove flying below. She plunges off the mountain, folds her wings, and dives headfirst onto her prey. The injured dove tumbles towards earth but before it can hit the ground, the peregrine swoops down and catches it. She carries the dove back up to a mountain ledge where she picks it apart with her razor sharp beak and talons. You can see the peregrine, whoops. You can see the peregrine over here catching the dove. That wonderful Utah landscape. And then you can of course see our peregrine falcon here behind me doing the same thing that that wild peregrine would be doing with, those, with that beak and those talons. After she finishes her meal, the peregrine finds some water to bathe in. Eating can be very messy, and because of this, she always stays near water. Today, she bathes in a desert pool in New Mexico. She splashes around, flapping her wings and dipping her head in and out of the water until every feather is wet. One by one, she carefully preens each feather with her beak. To get dry, she shakes the water from her feathers, much as a dog shakes water from its fur. She is now ready to continue her journey south. See that wet peregrine falcon? sitting in that desert pool. She lands on the Texas coast. Many other migrating peregrines also stop here during the month of October because there are so many kinds of birds to eat. The golden plover, laughing gull, and green-winged teal are just some of the birds the peregrine hunts. She spends several days here eating and resting. At times, she even plays with other peregrines. In a high-speed dance, they swoop, 
glide and chase each other across the sky. You can see the peregrines up front and then in the background, you can see all of those other birds flying around. Look at that beautiful ocean behind them. Can't hold onto the page. There we go. <laughs> the peregrine flies over the sea with no land in sight. From Texas, she could continue to fly over land, but instead she takes a shortcut and flies over the Gulf of Mexico. At times, she flies so close to the water that her wings nearly touch the waves. Several hours pass and the sun starts to set. The peregrine could fly through the night, but lands on a passing ship going in her direction. She perches on the ship's mast and gently closes her eyes. The captain watches her through the night as he steers the ship through dark seas. Hopefully you can see you have the captain there, the dark ocean, and way up here in the dark, oh, maybe you can see, there's the peregrine falcon. After a few days, the peregrine reaches land and is flying over Guatemala. She feels the winds pick up. Strong winds can be good or bad for the peregrine. If they are going in the wrong direction, they may blow her off course. But if they are going in the right direction, they can help her fly with a lot less effort. Today, the winds are blowing south and she glides on them for hours, hardly flapping her wings. The winds carry her up so high that a pilot flying by can see her from his cockpit window. There are the mountains of Guatemala. Down here on this far side, you can see the peregrine falcon with those long, narrow wings. And then up here, you can see the plane. While flying over Panama, the peregrine meets a flock of Swainsons and broad-winged hawks flying along the same route. These birds can fly in huge flocks of up to 10,000. There are so many birds that they seem to block out the sun. Sometimes they fly so close together that they are only about a foot apart. You might think that they would get in each other's way, but they don't. For a while, the peregrine joins these peaceful birds on their migration. You can see up close those broad-winged and Swainson's hawks. And then over here, these big group of migrating birds. The peregrine flies over a forest that looks like an enormous green ocean. She is above the rainforests of Colombia. She feels thirsty and looks for some water to drink. There is plenty of water here because it rains nearly every day. The peregrine lands next to a waterfall. She dips her head in and out of the water, taking long, deep drinks. After shaking her feathers dry, the peregrine flies straight up until she is again soaring over the lush green trees of the rainforest. You can see our peregrine here, dipping her beak down into the water, taking a good drink. She continues flying south until she is above the rainforests of Brazil. The sky turns gray, thunder strikes, and raindrops start to fall. It is hard for her to see through the clouds and fog, and the pounding rains make her wings feel tired. She lands in a tall tree. The tree's leaves shelter her from the falling rain. The peregrine closes her eyes and takes a nap until the late afternoon. She no longer needs to fly as far each day because she is nearing the end of her journey. 
see the rain in the rainforest. Our peregrine falcon settling down for a nap. It's a long journey to take. You might need some naps. The peregrine behind me is finishing up her quail meal for this morning. Sunset comes and the peregrine lands for the nights in the woodlands of Bolivia. While she is asleep, a great horned owl silently flies by, beating its powerful wings. The peregrine, <laughs> I'll adjust the screen here in a second. The peregrine does not have many predators, but one creature she must be wary of is the great horned owl. This fierce looking bird hunts her at night while she is sleeping. The owl has excellent eyesight and hearing and can usually find its prey no matter how well it's hidden. But tonight, the peregrine is lucky. The owl does not notice that she is carefully nestled between two tree branches. You can see the great horned owl hunting and the hidden peregrine falcon down here, tucked away for the night. See if I can turn this a little bit without. There we go. I'll see if I can adjust accordingly. <laughs> there we go. The peregrine arrives in Argentina. Surrounding her are miles and miles of swaying grasses with eucalyptus trees scattered here and there. She lands on the tallest tree in the valley and rests. This is the end of her journey. It has been two months since she left Alaska, over 8,000 miles away. During her migration, the peregrine visited such different places as the Arctic, the desert, the ocean, the rainforest, and even the city. Next March, she will make the long journey back to Alaska where she will raise another family. But for now, she is home. You can see the peregrine falcon. Good rouse from Artemis. You can see the peregrine falcon perching in that nice open valley in Argentina. Here's the last page. A little bit of information about peregrine falcons. I'll read some of it. The peregrine's journey is based on the migration of a real peregrine falcon that was tracked by satellite telemetry by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The name peregrine means wanderer, and the peregrine falcon has one of the largest migrations of any North American bird. The bird in this book is a tundra peregrine. Tundra nesting falcons winter in South America and may fly up to 18,000 miles in a year. The tundra peregrine is one of more than a dozen subspecies of peregrine falcon. Most peregrine falcons don't migrate. Peregrine falcons live on all continents except Antarctica and on many oceanic islands. They live in a wide variety of habitats from the tropics to the desert, from the ocean to the tundra, and from sea level up to 12,000 feet. Peregrine falcons are raptors, which means they hunt and kill their food. Their strong, sharp, curved beaks, keen eyes for viewing prey from great distances, and sharp, powerful claws called talons all make peregrines very well adapted for hunting. The peregrine falcon is the fastest animal in the world in its hunting dive, the stoop, in which it soars to a great height and then dives steeply at speeds up to 240 miles per hour onto its prey. The peregrine's incredible speed is the primary weapon used to kill their prey. When they get ready to strike, they close their talons and strike the bird in a plunging dive either knocking the bird unconscious or killing it with a single blow. In level flight, the normal speed for peregrines is about 40 to 55 miles per hour. Peregrine falcons feed almost exclusively on birds, including doves, waterfowl, and songbirds. 
peregrine falcons rarely suffer predation by other animals. That means that there aren't a lot of other things that hunt them. Great horned owls and golden eagles are known to occasionally kill peregrines. Peregrine eggs sometimes fall victim to raccoons and foxes. Human behavior is the greatest threat to the peregrine falcon. In the 1970s, the peregrine nearly became extinct because of the use of DDT and other pesticides which got into the bird's food. DDT caused peregrines to lay eggs with shells so thin that they would crack before the chicks could be born. By 1975, there were estimated to be only 39 nesting pairs of peregrines in the lower 48 states, and the bird was extinct or extirpated, locally extinct, east of the Mississippi River. The peregrine falcon was declared an endangered species, and a captive breeding and release program was established to ensure the bird's survival. Today, the peregrine falcon is doing much better. DDT is no longer used in the United States, and peregrines are now able to successfully raise their young. As a result, the peregrine falcon was removed from the endangered species list in 1999 over 20 years ago. So that was The Peregrine's Journey, A Story of Migration by Madeline Dunphy, illustrated by Kristen Kest. Reconfigure how I have the camera here, see if I can adjust it a little bit more. The lighting is a little bit awkward <laughs> for her being all the way up there against the lights, but we recently put in this nice tall perch for her. Peregrine falcons, like most birds, like to be really high up where they can see lots of things. So from her view here in our display museum at the Raptor Center, she can see some trees with lots of sparrows and starlings that like to nest in them. There are also, since we're here on the St. Paul campus of the University of Minnesota, we also oftentimes have cows that live behind the building. So there's lots of really interesting things for her to see here in this enclosure. So it's a really good spot for her. So we'll see her hopefully relaxing, getting some good sunshine, some good weather. I'm gonna move a little bit closer so I can see. I saw a couple of questions pop up while we were talking. <laughs> yes, of course. I, I had thought about this idea yesterday of reading in the enclosure with Artemis. She's such a well-known bird here in our community. She's one of them, um, has been one of the hardest working rafters who lives with us permanently here at the Raptor Center. Um, she's around 20 years old this year. So she's been doing programs with us for quite a long time. And has been one of our kind of hardest working program birds in a lot of our programs, both on-site and off-site. So she's an excellent example of a peregrine falcon and an excellent example of our education ambassadors here at the Raptor Center. So I'm gonna scroll back to the top because I know there's some questions right away at the beginning. So, <laughs> well, hello everybody. What is the first name? So we call her Artemis. Um, she doesn't know her name necessarily, but we use it to call uh, her. So that way we don't have to say peregrine falcon female number three, because that's not, that doesn't work very well with our human brains. We like names. So we call her Artemis. Those of us uh, familiar with our Greek and Roman mythology might recognize the name of the goddess of hunting. So she actually got that name when she was originally living with a falconer. So this is a bird who was actually intentionally raised in captivity. Um, she is not what we call a human imprint. She was raised by her parents. So she knows how to be a peregrine falcon. But for some reason, she wasn't very good at her job. And her job was to fly up really high and dive down to catch other birds while working with a human that we call a falconer, somebody who hunts with raptors. And since she wasn't very good at her job, um, the falconer really needed a bird who was able to fly those really high up distances to dive down in that stoop or that strong, powerful dive that peregrine falcons need to be able to do to catch their prey. And since she couldn't fly or wouldn't fly very high, um, she wasn't very good at that job. So luckily she was brought to the Raptor Center and she was very, very good at her second job, which was teaching people about raptors and still is teaching people about raptors. So she is uh, an excellent example of a raptor so that the name um, Artemis kind of stuck with her that whole time. So that is her name and that's where she got it. What do they do when they don't have visitors? 
Well, for a lot of the birds, um, this isn't too unusual, but I have been noticing that a lot of birds, especially since we don't have visitors on site to look at, and a lot of the birds aren't going outside of the Raptor Center and getting that enrichment from seeing lots of new places, we've been trying to give them other activities to do. So we have some birds who are trained to fly in our program room that we've been working on. We've been providing lots more enrichment items, so toys for them to either manipulate or rip apart. I know we've done a lot of videos on enrichment in the past. If you're curious, you can probably look through our page or we'll be posting some other videos of that as well. Um, we've been doing lots more of those kinds of toys to give them something to physically do and mentally think about when they get their food. Because yeah, right now, not as many things to look at. <laughs> For especially a lot of our birds back in our main housing courtyard area, they are still partially outside, kind of like we are right now, um, where they have access to sunshine and rain. If it snows, maybe it won't snow anymore. Um, but they get a lot of good weather out there as well, but still not quite the same as having people around all the time. So trying to give them lots of other stuff to do. What is her very favorite food? Her very favorite food, I would have to guess, um, I don't know for sure, but when she eats her food, she seems very enthusiastic about quail, which makes a lot of sense. A lot of the food that our peregrine falcons get here at the Raptor Center is food like uh, chicken chicks or other adult chickens, or they get quail every once in a while for variety. We'll give them things like rats or mice. Um, but usually they're getting birds, and I think quail is probably the favorite, which makes sense. It's a very, uh, a very rich, kind of dense meat, and so I think that seems to be the favorite. It also has a lot of very long, fluffy feathers on the quail, so there's usually a lot of fun things to rip apart and pull apart, which has some kind of nice built-in enrichment. I see some peregrine falcon fans in the audience, which is fantastic. I'm so glad you were able to join us for today. So yeah, some people who are seeing peregrine falcons nesting around them. If you're looking for peregrine falcon nests or places to observe them, here in the Twin Cities, we certainly have a couple of nests in both downtown St. Paul and Minneapolis. We also have a couple um, out in more of the suburbs on some tall buildings. Um, I know out near the Golden Valley Blaine area, there's one on top of one of those big Wells Fargo buildings, places like that. Um, but really all around the world, especially here in North America, we have a lot of peregrine falcons nesting on top of our tall buildings. Their natural nesting sites are cliffs, like the kind of fake cliff that we've added here. Um, but if you think about what skyscrapers or other tall buildings look like, they're tall buildings with nice flat, kind of concrete, rocky surfaces. They're perfect imitations of their natural nesting habitat. So they are a great place to look for peregrine falcons. Ooh, somebody wants to know how much the peregrine falcon weighs. So this particular peregrine falcon, I weighed her on our scale right before we came in here, and she weighs 1,000 grams on the dot, one kilogram. But for those of us who like to think more in pounds, she weighs about two and a half pounds, which is pretty normal size for a peregrine falcon here in North America, especially for the females. Um, in general, in the raptor world, the females or the girls tend to be bigger than the boys. And one of the largest differences is between our peregrine falcons. The males or the boys can be one third smaller. So that means that if she weighs two and a half pounds, a male might only weigh between a pound and a half to two pounds. So it doesn't sound like a big difference, but that's a big amount of weight to be different. The difference in size a lot of times can help them hunt different prey. So the larger females can hunt larger prey and the smaller males can hunt smaller prey. So that way when they're living together in the same place hunting in the same area, they're not accidentally competing with each other for food. They both can hunt different kinds of birds, catch different sizes of birds, and that way there's plenty of food for them to both be able to catch. How fast can they dive? One of my favorite facts about peregrine falcons, they are the fastest animal in the entire world. A lot of people say, um, I'm pretty sure cheetahs are the fastest. And you're right, cheetahs are a really fast land animal, but peregrine falcons have them beat by quite a bit. Our cheetahs can run around 70 miles an hour, which is 
very impressive, don't get me wrong. I know I can't run that fast. But peregrine falcons, when they are tucking their wings in and going into that steep dive, we call a stoop, they have been clocked going over 240 miles per hour. That's pretty fast, pretty impressive. So that makes them the fastest animal in the entire world. Question, do we wash or play with them? If so, when? Um, I wouldn't describe anything as playing with them. This bird is kind of like a coworker for me. Um, so we don't really hang out, but we do a lot of work uh, with enrichment, like I said, so training. For example, this is one big kind of enrichment activity for her. I'll see if I can move the camera around a little bit here. This is one kind of big enrichment activity for her. I'm trying to get the lighting a little bit better so it's not so backlit. Just a moment. So this is one big enrichment activity for Artemis. Hi, oh, too scared? Too much? Kind of weird? Sorry, I moved some large objects around. So, um, so all of this kind of enrichment is really important for them to be able to have lots of activity. She also has a water pan I'm almost standing inside of right now. Um, so she can take a bath herself. So she has a really important way of keeping herself clean. And that's another fun activity that she can do on her own while she's in her enclosure. To a couple more questions and then as I was saying in the beginning we've been having a problem here at the Raptor Center whenever we do a Facebook live event it usually cuts us off at about 40 minutes for some reason so I'm trying to cut us off before that happens does she have any friends are there other peregrine falcons around that is a really good question let me see if I can I'm trying to get some better lighting I kind of figured this would be a problem in here but I was hoping for a little better there we go um, are there other peregrine falcons around? Um, she lives by herself. All of our birds have their own enclosures. Um, so that way we know that they have plenty of space, they're eating all of their food, they've got plenty of room to move around and they don't have to worry about any other birds around them. So that way they stay the safest. Um, and also have kind of, like I said, the most room to be able to move around and do their activities. Um, in general, peregrine falcons especially can be quite territorial, which means that if she sees other peregrine falcons around, she needs to make sure that they know, hey, this is her space to live in. So she wants to make sure that those other peregrine falcons stay far away, which makes a lot of sense. If your whole lifestyle relies on being able to catch all the food that you need and there's someone else in your space catching that food too, excellent natural behavior. Um, you want to make sure that they stay far away. You don't want them eating the birds that you want to eat. You want those birds for yourself. So peregrine falcons usually are quite territorial, very good at defending their spaces from other peregrine falcons. Let's do uh, one more question that we haven't. How old is, how do they fly? Has she ever laid an egg, boy or girl? Okay, um, so how do they fly? Sorry, the mirroring is kind of throwing me off. How do they fly? So peregrine falcons, let's see, can I move a little bit closer to you? You might notice, especially right now she's in this silhouette, again, sorry, the lighting is a little bit funky with all this beautiful sunshine we're having. You can see she has very long, narrow tail, very long, pointy wings. So peregrine falcons, when they fly, um, they do a lot of, they have to do a lot of flapping. They don't get to do as much soaring as some of our other raptors do, like our eagles or our vultures or our red-tailed hawks. They need to do a lot of flapping. So when they're actually flying instead of diving, um, they can only go about 40, maybe 50 miles an hour or so, and they have to do a lot of work to do it. So you'll usually see them doing a kind of flap, flap, glide, flap, flap, glide kind of wing beat pattern. That's how they're able to fly. When they're actually doing that dive, they'll kind of tuck those wings in and enter into that really nice steep dive. Let's do like one more. Ooh, okay, we'll do one more question about her on here before we wrap up. Um, somebody asked, how do they make their nests? This is a very fun fact, I think, about peregrine falcons, which is that they kind of don't make their own nests. Peregrine falcons make what's called a scrape. And so instead of building a whole big nest with sticks and twigs and soft grasses and things like that, like many other birds do, they actually find the side of a cliff or a nice flat area on the side of a building, and they might kind of kick some of the dirt around, might move a couple of stones around. Maybe there will be a couple of nice soft feathers there, 
But what they really do is they kind of clear off a little bit of space and then just lay their eggs there. So it is called a scrape instead of a nest. And I think that's a really good descriptive word because that's kind of what they do is they kind of scrape a little divot into the side of a cliff or on the side of a building. And then they lay their eggs right there on that side of that cliff or that building. So they really don't build their own nests. Um, that's pretty common for falcons. They tend to either uh, small falcons, like our American kestrels, are usually looking for things like holes in dead trees and stuff like that. I'm trying to turn around here. Or um, their larger falcons are usually nesting on the sides of cliffs, things like that. So we'll, we'll call it here just because I'm afraid that Facebook is going to kick us off again. Um, but thank you all so much for joining me and Artemis for reading with raptors on this wonderful, beautiful Tuesday. Hopefully you all get a chance to go outside and look for some more migrating birds. We have a lot of songbirds that are going to start showing up soon and a lot of raptors that are going to start showing up soon as well who have been heading down south for the winter and are coming back now that we're getting into spring. So hopefully you can all get outside and enjoy some good weather. Well, of course, everyone keeping safe and healthy out there. So again, thank you all so much for joining us. We will see you all next week. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll make sure to answer any remaining questions in text form. But this has been Artemis, the Peregrine Falcon, here at the Raptor Center. Thank you all so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day.